Hi everyone, sorry for my slightly delayed start to today's museum moment. Um, it turns out there are things you can do on Facebook, but it doesn't really make sense. So I guess, you know, timeliness is not something that is, you know, well known in the world of comedy. So it makes sense that I would be a little bit late today as we are exploring the story of Kentucky Fried Theater. Now, I hope some people are here what I would love is to see as you guys are watching, hi, Annalisa and hi, Mitch. Uh, if you have favorite, uh, you know, quotes from Airplane or Naked Gun or, um, you know, any of the Zucker Brothers, Jim Abrams movies, throw them out there. Throw in the things that you love. Make sure we're sharing our comments. Uh, if you have personal stories, throw those out into the comments as well. We'd love to hear more of them. I see Andy Mushin just joined. He wrote a fabulous article in the 1980s for the Chronicle about this. Um, and so I've, I've read it, Andy. I hope that I don't do it uh, a disservice. So picture it, 1970, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And just think about all the turmoil and all of the unrest in Madison at that time. And strangely, something that you wouldn't consider um, is that David Zucker, one of the eminent Zucker brothers, is actually president of the senior class of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he is figuring out what he's doing with his life and all of these things. Um, oh, that's funny. Andy Mushin does not recall writing this article. Um, <laughs> You did, Andy. You wrote an article in the 1980s about, uh, about I think, actually, about this origin story. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll add it to the list after. So the um, David Zucker is the president of the senior class. And at the time, there's so much unrest on campuses across the country. And in fact, one of the things that he's pushing for is that students not rent graduation cap and gowns, that instead they put that money towards electing peace candidates to Congress um, and that they are having this moment of really thinking about what it means to be a student in Madison. He gives a very serious graduate, um, you know, graduation address. Um, he's concerned about ecology. He's worried about this. And he's also worried about what is next in his life. What is he going to do? What are his next steps? I think many of us have been there. Um, and he's kind of in this place where his brother is also in Madison, um, and they have some friends there. Uh, he travels to, and actually I think he travels to, um, Chicago and sees a sketch comedy performance. It's really, you know, one of these things, they sit on a waterbed. It's like happening. There are all of these really primitive video installations. And he's just like, this is what we should be doing. So he comes back together with his brother, Jerry. And then he um, comes back and they try and think of who are the funniest people they know. And they come around to other, to other Milwaukeeans. Jim Abrahams is the first of these. And Jim and his brother were kind of famous on campus for doing these classic and terrible pranks. For instance, Dick Chudna, the, uh, the uh, roommate, would bandage his foot and come in to the library carrying a bunch of books with a cane. And Jim Abrams would knock the cane out and he'd fall over. And then Chudnow would get up and beat Jim Abrahams with the cane. And they would do this for people studying for like midterms and finals. And then they'd run out. And sometimes people would not understand that this was like guerrilla theater. And they would run after uh, Dick or Jim, whichever, and try and beat them up because they thought that they had done this disservice to this person in the library. You know, so that's the sort of thing that they would do. It seems like an excellent story to recount the day after uh, April Fool's. And they come back together and they think about, we're going to make this new medium and we're going to bring it to Madison. Initially, they, they put this in a, the back of a restaurant. The restaurant is condemned and, they, and it's told they, they're told they can't be in that restaurant. From there, they move this whole installation. They built a theater. They borrowed and bought lights and all this stuff. They built a stage and they have to move it. And they move it into the Memorial Union and they can set it up for a day and then they have to take it all down. And they can set it up for a day and they have to take it all down. And it becomes the super hot ticket in Madison. Eventually they move into the back of a bookstore called Shakespeare and Company. And this is like where you wanna go. They name this troupe Kentucky Fried Theater because their initial thought is not that they're gonna do a sketch comedy show and people are gonna to come to them. Their initial thought, and this is so kind of funny is in this age of social isolation, that they are going to deliver comedy to your door. 
It's going to be like the takeout of comedy and you can come in and get it. One idea that is evidenced in this is that one of the initial things they do, and this is a little scatological, but you know, I, I'm hoping that someday some 12 year old is watching this and gets really excited by it, that you could call a number and get, just listen to fart sounds. And that would be the, uh, the way that they would, uh, that that was part of this, uh, getting the story, getting comedy out there. Supposedly the number was so popular that they actually had to stop it because they would sit there and it wasn't like they had a recording. They were actually picking up the phone and making fart sounds, fun and games. So they continue this process of this crazy raucous uh, program. They involve their families and that becomes kind of a theme. Um, Mrs. Zucker, Charlotte, does in their first performance installation, she does a short sketch that is recorded about a miracle thimble, and it is such a great thimble, but it's on her middle finger, so you can imagine what that looks like. It's a little risque, um, but always funnier when you have an older lady, you know, flipping the bird. Um, and she becomes a star later on as they move into the movies. Um, in Airplane, she is the lady who's applying her makeup um, very messily. Um, so they're in this place. This becomes the sold out standing room only ticket in Madison. And everybody wants to be there. Initially, as they start, they don't actually understand what goes into making a full live show. And they're supposed to have like 90 minutes worth of material. And after about 20, they're done. And so Dick Chud now goes out as they're trying to think, do we need to give everybody their money back? Do we need to start over? What could we possibly do? And he starts doing improv. And this, he had had some improv training and people love it. And this becomes the basis of his future venture, which we'll get to in a second. In 1972, right after Jerry Zucker graduates, they take this troupe and they move it to LA. And they establish it in LA and it becomes a success there. Within a couple of years, they are appearing on The Tonight Show. Big deal. Can you imagine you're going from the back of a Madison bookstore to The Tonight Show? And actually, according to Jerry Zucker, who was the commencement speaker in Madison in 2003, they bombed this and they thought about it for a long time. And his advice to the students is, don't think about the things you did wrong, think about the things you were great at. Um, so, and thank you to my intern, Emma, who found that, that great nugget for me. Um, so they start this performance. One of the things that I found to be very serendipitous about this is its kind of impact on broader comedy. One of the people who sees their show in LA is a young comedy producer and comedian, Lauren Michaels and Chevy Chase. And they bring an NBC executive to see Kentucky Fried Theater. And he's wowed. They've never laughed harder. That's what he says. And at the end of this, they come up with a concept for a new show that's going to change the way television looks and certainly the way comedy looks in America. Now, the Zucker brothers and Jim Abrahams go on to produce many, many movies. And together they create kind of comedy history with Airplane and um, the Naked Gun series. And really one of the things that is a trademark that comes up early in the Kentucky Fried Theater origin is this sense that there needs to be three jokes a minute. That if one joke bombs, you still have two more coming. And I think you certainly see that in Airplane, just how fast that goes. It's a pterodactyl, it's a brooch. Um, all of those sorts of, you know, that kind of quick styling, the both visual and verbal comedy that is constantly at play. Dick Chen now comes back to Milwaukee and sees a comedy landscape that isn't entirely, there isn't a lot going on, and says, what can I do? And goes back to that improv question and establishes comedy sports here. That was in 1984. They just celebrated their like 36th anniversary. Comedy sports is in over 28 cities all over the world. There's a, there's a franchise in Berlin. I think there's one in Manchester, England. And people are taking that template of having two competing uh, improv troops kind of going against each other and making great shows um, week to week to week. And, and it started here and is continued, you know, this kind of tradition of Milwaukee comedy and bringing that kind of raucous energy from Kentucky Fried Theater, except in a way that is very family friendly and accessible to uh, populations around America and the world. And so when you think about, you know, kind of these funny people and where they start, I wanted to go back 
And I wanted to end today with, um, with some statements from Jerry Zucker's graduation address at Madison. So he, and then because it's Milwaukee, of course, and I'm writing for Milwaukee, he talks about his Milwaukee childhood. So here is one of his five charters that he's giving to the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2003. He says, number three, Mrs. Zubatsky's Law. One day, when I was a kid, our house caught on fire in Milwaukee. A large section of the wood shingle roof was burning as the fire trucks pulled up. The fireman ran into the backyard with a large hose and began assembling their metal ladders and positioning them against the house. Mrs. Zubatsky was our next door neighbor, and at the time she was standing on her upstairs porch, taking in the laundry. She watched anxiously as the firemen struggled with their ladders. Suddenly she leaned over the balcony and shouted to the professional firefighters, forget the ladders, just point the hose at the fire. The firemen, to their credit, responded immediately. They dropped their ladders, pointed the hose at the fire, and extinguished the blaze in about 40 seconds. There are two morals to this story. One, never assume because it's someone's job that they know how to do it. And two, don't let yourself be intimidated by professionals or their uniforms. Growing up in Wisconsin, I never knew anyone in the movie business. I never knew anyone who knew anyone in the movie business. The, that world had a mystique that made it seem unattainable to me. But like Mrs. Zubotsky, I sat on my porch, I watched someone else do it, and I said, I have a better idea. And like her, I seized the moment. If you have a better idea, if your plan makes more sense, if you have a vision, then put down your laundry and scream a little bit. Throw your hat into the ring and never let professionals or their uniforms prevent you from telling anyone where to point their hose. Thanks so much for joining me for this museum moment. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you again tomorrow when we look at Florence Eisman and uh, her legacy. If you've enjoyed these museum moments, consider making a little gift to the museum. You can do that through our website, www.jewishmuseummilwaukee.org. Um, or I think there's a donate button right here on Facebook. Thanks, have a great day.